Welcome back to World War II TV again. And with memorials and movies, flypasts and fanfares, nothing immortalizes Britain's defeat of the Luftwaffe in 1940 more than the iconic Spitfire. To examine that claim, we have James Jeffries, who's been on the channel numerous times before. There are links to his previous uh, uh, appearances in the description below. And if you're finding this because it's a shorter show, we hope you kind of stay with us and pick up some of the longer format, kind of normal format World War II TV shows where we discuss things over an hour, hour and a half. But we're not doing that now. We're bringing in James for 20 minutes or so. So good evening, James. How are you today? I'm good. Yeah, looking forward to this. Very much so. Good to be back. So we'll 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 start straight away. Uh, you're going to make your 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 case there, the Spitfire legend, and we'll maybe have time for a few questions at the end. We'll see. But James, over to you. Just tell me where to nudge on the slides. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the Spitfire. It's iconic. It is the symbol of of the Royal Air Force, 1940, the Battle of Britain. And I mean, you can't miss it wherever you go. It, it, it's a part of, of Britishness and, and that era. Where does it stem from? I mean, you've got things like the Spitfire Fighter Fund, do it now. You don't really have that. You don't, certainly don't have a Hawker Hurricane uh, Fighter Fund. It screams of modernity. Look at it, the all metal design, the wings, et cetera. It's just, and then you've got the film. It's titled there, Spitfire. We would probably know it in Britain as the first of the few. It was entitled Spitfire for the American market. Leslie Howard, David Niven, uh, about the story of the birth of the Spitfire. There's a lot of inaccuracies in it. Uh, but the essence of capturing this link with the Schneider Trophy and, and breaking records and such like in the 20s, et cetera, leading to the Spitfire. Yeah, it's it's embedded itself. It's made in 1942. It's got a purpose. And then subsequently from that, we've got films like The Battle of Britain, which is Spitfire heavy. I love the film, but there is a heavier proportion of Spitfires to what was the truth. We'll go into that. And then you've got things like that, like the Dinky Spitfire, the must-have toy of the late 1960s. You have the Airfix kits. You know, what? it is the most sold Airfix kit, the Spitfire. It's captured us. There's something about the Spitfire that's just, yeah, we, we want to look at it. I, I won't lie. I love it. I'm not going to bash the Spitfire here. It's a beautiful aircraft. Um, whenever one flies over my house or nearby, not very often, I will run out into the garden, into the street. You just cannot miss that sound. Even though, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's what got me into history and looking about aircrafts. So anyway, that's the first things to throw at you. But it wasn't the single factor that won the Battle of Britain. This is the main thing I'm going to say. There are a number of reasons. So the next slide, one of the biggest re, uh, vi reasons for the victory of the Battle of Britain uh, for the Royal Air Force, although the term victory does come with contention. So I would say, is it really a victory? Is it something more of a draw? That's another discussion. We have what is the Dowding system. Hugh Dowding, uh, head of RAF Fighter Command, this, this absolutely brilliant system using radar and detection, and you'll see the plotters there mapping when these raids come in. You've got things like the Observer Corps top right corner that are spotting it by eye, counting how many aircraft are coming so that aircraft are scrambled. They, they have this early warning system, and that gives the RAF a huge advantage. And they've been preparing for this for a number of years. So the biggest thing is the RAF are prepared. They're ready for this. They're built for this. Certainly fighter command. Um, and that's, again, if we just go on to the next slide, building onto this uh, idea, it goes beyond the doubting system as well. So you've got things, uh, um, basically, uh, you know, the, the home defense system, you've got the barrage balloons, you've got the anti-aircraft, uh, they're alerted. Nothing is wasted. It's all absolutely pinpoint. You've got you know, the the, uh, the home defense in the sense of the air raid, uh, ARP wardens, the firefighters, etc. It's all interlinked so as to know when to have those air raid uh, sirens ready so it doesn't disrupt work, etc., etc. And one of the biggest things is the Royal Navy. It's a, it's massive. It's absolutely huge. It's um, I think it was Derek Robertson described it as the silent victory of the Battle of Britain was the Royal Navy because it just... Yeah, it, it, it's there. It's 10 times the size, I think, of, of uh, yeah. the Kriegsmarine. Um, and the home fleet, I mean, yeah, I've got a couple of stats here. The Kriegsmarine has lost a lot of ships in the Battle for Norway building up to this. So it's lost two of six light cruisers, 10 out of 20 destroyers, six U-boats, and it's only got 10 U-boats able to operate. Um, the home fleet, on the other hand, has 67 destroyers, over 100 smaller corvettes and minesweepers, six cruisers, five capital ships. I, I, that absolutely dwarfs it. If you're going to send ships out for an invasion, it's just absolutely no contest. This is just the home fleet as well. So, and that's another reason why the Luftwaffe has to gain control of the air is this is just to make sure that Royal Navy can't operate. Even so, the numbers absolutely speak for themselves. Um, and yeah, th that's another sort of deterrent. We'll go on to the next section. 
Uh, we then have linked again to the Dowding system. We've got an absolutely well integrated process of repair and maintenance. These are things that the Luftwaffe don't have. So you have things like the civilian repair uh, organization that are linked uh, to civilian firms, later becomes 43 Group RF Maintenance Command. Um, it's absolutely ingenious. And they have different processes of repairing at different stages, some near the airfield, some further back, taking up factories. There's just not this kind of management in the Luftwaffe. So aircraft were repaired much, much quicker. Um, and, the, and the building process, the RAF are absolutely outstripping the Germans when it comes to building fighters. I can't remember what the stats are. I do apologize. I should have probably got those beforehand. This is just an overview. That's another thing to consider. It's absolutely on the front foot here. Uh, and just another thing linked to the Dowding system, there's a rotation system with squadrons. So pilots are given rest. This is something that Dowding has insisted. He insisted on it during the First World War when he was a squadron commander um, and was kind of like shunned aside because of it. Pilots will rest. You have operational training units um, and you have different stages of where these squadrons are available, whether they are 30 minutes away, et cetera, at readiness. You've got the system there at the middle leading up to actually when they're in the air and the enemy sighted and they're engaging. So everything is there. It's aware. It's it's known of. It's an absolute beast of a machine that's there to defend the country. And the Germans have to learn this in reverse. They have to learn it later on as they come under attack. I know we had the talk the other day uh, from the Downing system. So do watch that. Yeah, uh, well, well, the link to that is in the description below, folks. And just to, to, to jump in, because I will, yeah. we, we still have this, along with the Spitfire being the sole factor, we also have this idea that the British were completely unprepared for World War II yeah. and that when the Germans you know, launched Blitzkrieg, we, we're suddenly hastily deciding how we're going to do this now. And the fact is, uh, yes, there are lots of shortages. There are things the British have to work on and improve on and, and, and invent and, and discuss, but we weren't absolutely caught off guard. The RAF has been working for this type of event for a number of years so i think it's important well if you you're the expert to kind of clarify the fact that you know the the, the, the defense system wasn't thrown together on a cigarette packet in a pub in a week after after blitzkrieg it had been something in process for some time mm, absolutely yeah and, and as i say rf fighter command is probably well it is the most prepared of, of the royal air force at that stage coast command have a, things to learn bomber command certainly have a lot to learn they yeah. they have heavy losses at the start of the war and have to learn this new way and get new technology to develop but fighter command is ready it's got modern aircraft um and even things like the way that airfields are laid out where you have the pens to protect the the fighters this is learn actually mm. just thinking of it this is off the cuff actually these airfields, these systems have been in place for years. The Luftwaffe are coming into airfields that might have been bombed, that need repairing, that have been part of, that were French literally weeks, maybe months beforehand. They're having to get used to that. And they're in a hostile zone. Uh, the British aren't. And of course, you've got the home ground advantage thing, which goes without saying. Pilots bailed out, could be flying you know, a few hours later for the Luftwaffe. It's for you, Fritz, the war is over, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, you've got all of these things going for it if we go to the next slide this is the one that i think people are going to be going oh here he goes um he's going to be talking about the hurricane i do love the hurricane i have a soft spot for it and just a few points about the hurricane i mean i don't want to pin anything on one particular aircraft and that's the lesson of this is the spitfire is a remarkable aircraft incredible aircraft but there are a whole lot of other factors to consider when it comes to the you know the, the battle of britain and um, I mean, we were, we were discussing beforehand that that's often the case. We will sometimes go, oh, this was the war winning moment. This is the war winning yep. machine. It's like, actually, there's processes, not just the materials. There are the, there is the training. There is there's so much going into this. Um, and just a few facts. I mean, you could say, actually, the winner here is the Merlin engine. We well, could say that's a general thing for Allied aircraft in the Second World War. It's an incredible engine. Um, the fact that it's then used for the Mosquito, the Lancaster, you know, the, the Mustang, et cetera, et cetera. It proves itself first in the Battle of Britain as a reliable engine, as one that can be improved, developed. Another little thing I kind of want to mention is Keith Park, head of um, 11 Group during the Battle of Britain, chooses to fly a Hurricane, which he customizes. Now, I don't know, this is a small point. He could have chosen a Spitfire. Um, he yeah, he's, he's big enough to choose exactly what he wants, isn't it? If he, if he yeah. wants it and he can have it whatever color he wants. <laughs> <laughs> it's Keith Park. Yeah. Whatever he wants it. yeah, and he goes for a hurricane. That's just a little thing. You know, I think I think Park had a soft spot for the hurricane. Um, we've also got the VC, the Victoria Cross winner, the fighter command, the Battle of Britain, the only one in the war, um, James Nicholson, flying a hurricane. The top scoring squadron were hurricanes. Uh, we have three or three squadron. 
Um, and that's that's the other thing. The advantage the RAF have actually is this international element, and they're able to train their air crews away. They're able to train them in in Canada, especially later on in the war when you're building a huge bomber force and building the air force you've got these vast places to train the Luftwaffe don't have that luxury it's a war zone pretty much everywhere they are they've got limited resources to 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 build on um and as well as the hurricane it's easier to repair there's canvas you can have shell holes go straight through it it's patched up as long as it doesn't hit anything major the, the spitfire all metal yeah you have to spend a lot more time repairing it and the spitfire is a bit of a nightmare when it first comes with the elliptical wing new tools have to be developed and that is linked and learned through the repair system as well don't have that with the hurricane so we're just talking 1940 here a lot of people will probably be going oh well, what about it? we're just talking 1940 yep, yep. you know it's, it's only it's not that much slower than than the spitfire it can out turn a 109 in capable hands it's got the stable gun platform the wheels are slightly wider and easier to 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 use as it as it's rolling around the airfield and such like it's got lots going for it um but again i don't want to really pin it on on one aircraft or one factor um, and one interesting factor i found out as well is a hawker hurricane's about a third of the price to produce than the spitfire as well so you know pound for money yeah pound for pound it's important i mean yeah you know, that, that's, you know, that's, uh, Absolutely, there's all these factors going for it. Um, we did the series on war, war economics a couple of weeks yeah. ago, and you know, without without money to pay for stuff, you can't win a war. And so, managing the the, the resources is as important an asset as um as actually watch aircraft. And just before we move on from aircraft, mm. just to show what a knowledgeable bunch there are watching, Darren Little, of course, is saying, "What about the battle, the Benin, the Beaufort, the Defiant, mm. many other factors in play working behind these, Which is the point you're making, yeah. and uh, particularly to, to maybe uh, we address Ian Carr's comment there, it's don't forget the Gladiator yeah. Defiant and Benham, the first two of which allowed Harrys and Spitz to be deployed to the southeast. There's the rest of Britain that is involved in the conflict in a different way, um, but, but we can't, you know, we can't ignore that as well. Yeah, absolutely. There are these aircraft, and I mean, I was on the show before talking about we need to talk about Coastal Commander Bomber Command's part in the yeah. in the Battle of Britain. It's not just about the fighters. This is this is the whole point. And yeah, there are other fighters within Fighter Command. The Defiant becomes, um, you know, a, a stopgap as a night fighter. The Blenheim is the first uh, aircraft to shoot down a, a German bomber by night using radar. It's yeah, they're all there. They're all helpful. It isn't just about people, you know, fighter pilots, officers waiting on chairs for a phone to ring just to yeah. go up and intercept the enemy. It's, yeah, it, it's far more broader than that. There's also the factor of, there's the argument, well, the Hurricanes went after the bombers and the Spitfires went after the fighters and there were less of them. I mean, there's two things I'll say to that is when it comes to air combat, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, aircraft flash before you in seconds. Um, you know, you get blue on blue as a consequence as well. That's something else. That's something else I'd love to talk about at some stage. Mm. Um and yeah, it, it, it's it's a difficult concept. It's it's not as easy. It's not like the computer games and how you see it in, in the movies. It's it really is literally seconds. Something flashes before you, and you make a quick decision whether to shoot at it or not. You've only got a limited amount of firepower when you're in that combat zone. Um, and also, isn't the priority to shoot down bombers when it comes to it? There's a scene in the Battle of Britain film where they go leave the playing fighters. It's the bombers we want. Yeah. Um, it's true. They're the ones that you're going to want to be on. So I don't really, I don't really buy that argument. But anyway, we should move on because. Uh, well, I just, I just want to put up Jonathan, uh, Jonathan's yeah. uh, viewer comment there because it'll, it'll spark some controversy. But oh, it, it, was, it was too humorous not to put up. So Jonathan said, "Hurricane was the buxom country lass to the Spitfire's femme fatale." So uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a way of describing it. I think some people are going, "Oh," and some people are going, "Yeah, you could say that." It's. I just, I had to, I had to put it up. It's, it no, is what no. it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've heard that before. The Spitfire is the girl you have a wild weekend with, and the Hurricane's the one that you marry. Um, and yeah, settle down that's a with. much yeah. more that's a much more charming <laughs> way of putting it, James. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yes. Uh, but anyway, we get to the the final slide. I think another thing to consider is we talked about how prepared the RAF were, or Fighter Command were, how unprepared the Germans were. That they're not really expecting this campaign. The Luftwaffe's not built for it. Um, the 109 has limited range. And again, this is found with the Spitfire in 1941 when the RAF gone on the offensive. It runs out of fuel. Yeah, it's a great fighter. It's only got 10 minutes over London, which isn't really enough. It, and also you've got Goering completely out of touch, asking for the fighters to be as close to the bombers as possible, limiting their effectiveness, guzzling up fuel. And aircraft like the Stuka that, you know, when, they, when the Luftwaffe has air superiority, air supremacy, whatever, um, 
is a useful aircraft over in the Battle of Britain it's found wanting. There's no role for it. And it's vulnerable. It's like the fairy battles in the Battle of France getting shot out of the sky. It's pretty useless. And even the bombers, when they're unescorted, they're shot down in large numbers. You, you have the raids in the north of England with the unescorted. OK, there are a few Mr. Smith 1-1-0s. Uh, but the RAF have a, a field day, you know, with no losses. Um, that's the other thing really to bear in mind. They're just not prepared for this. This is... You think about what happens later on in the war, 44, big week, etc. That's how you win air superiority. You've got the, the aircraft for the task. You've got the bigger bombers that are well armed. You've got the long range fighters, etc., etc. This is a completely different air battle. This is four years before. It's just not prepared. This hasn't happened before. There's a lot of learning going on. And you've also got Adolf Hitler, who is thinking about Barbarossa and invading the Soviet Union already yeah, before the battle's yeah. even over. The focus is just not there. It's just, oh, well, you know, they're, they're off the continent thinking land campaign as usual. So, yeah, it's not going for the Germans. And the big thing I want to say is this isn't putting down the victory of the RAF, because I sometimes I get, get that. It is. It was an absolutely incredible story, the Battle of Britain. It doesn't take away from the bravery, and the threat at the time was incredibly real, absolutely incredible, incredibly real. Um, but these are factors that we have known of since, uh, that we've learned of since. And even Operation Sea Lion, the invasion of England, it's cobbled together. I don't want to get into the debate of whether it would have worked or not. Um, no. But the, 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 no, please, please, no. I don't know. I mean, I mean, no, we won't get into it. And the answer is no anyway. That would be my, it is my no family. anyway, yeah. Um, but that that's hodgepodge, you know, that their barge is taken from the Rhine, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It they haven't really thought it through. And again, that's not putting down the, the Battle of the Barges, which I actually really want to talk about when it comes to the, the, the Battle of Britain, the, the RAF bombers bombing the barges and the naval yeah, element. Yeah. It, it is important, but yeah, you, you look at it, it's higgledy piggledy, it's very amateur compared to what the RAF have. And like I say, there isn't the repair system limited rotation of the air crew as well so they're generally pretty exhausted you've got that big channel to cross um yeah it's one of the other factors is just how unprepared the germans were um i think i've just come under and i've just uh under the time but well we yeah. have well we'll do a couple of questions and i mean i think of all the myth shows i've got planned and there'll probably be another round of them sometime in 2024 this is one of the myths part of me wants to to, to change it but part of me accepts the fact we ain't gonna shift anything at all exactly. little, little boys and girls buying model kits at seven or eight nine years old it will be the spitfire the spitfire yep. is is going to retain its place on the kind of popular stakes and then as we get older we can examine the data we can look at the uh the stories and as you've said tonight we can understand it's part of a part of a whole structure part of a whole system but you and I talking for 20 minutes are not going to, we're, we're not going to change the trend there at all. But one um, interesting question from, from Rob Crane, which we just have time for, is he does wonder how it might have been different if the Luftwaffe had had a heavy bomber. I mean, they they were arguably ahead of the game a little bit with some of their fighter development. They didn't have a heavy bomber. It took the Allies another two or three years to really get a heavy bomber. So, but but would that have made a difference? I know it's sort of counterfactual stuff. What do you reckon, James? I, I can't. I can't stand counterfactual at all. Honestly, it's fun, but ultimately, you know, you'll, you'll have that counter argument that makes it null and void. I, I think if you look at the heavy bomb bomber campaign from the Allies, it took years yeah. to work out how to use them effectively, and that was using them. I mean, if they'd have used them in daylight, they would have been shot out of the sky, which is what happened to the four engine bombers before 1944 mm. when they flew in daylight. Um, and again, the technology that would have been developed to have made them effective at night is just a lot I know, I know you've got the beams and such like with coventry uh, but it's, it's going to take years it's going to be a campaign and the germans just look off aren't fighting that sort of war so my gut feeling is it wouldn't have made an immediate difference not when you're looking at august september 1940 maybe onwards down the line but by then they're off it's too late anyway yeah they're off invading the soviet union so well, I think another way to just to, to sum things up is a great comment from uh, Rhode Island's hidden history here. It's all about your whole toolbox and how you use them. I think mm. that's a very good analogy. The Germans have some pretty good individual tools in their toolbox mm. and some poorer ones, but the British, who arguably have some better ones and some equivalent ones, but overall we're putting them to a better use as part of an integrated system. And I think that's that would be my takeaway, both from Dilip's show on yeah. Friday and what I've spoken to you about tonight and in previous shows. It's that overall, we used our team better as the Allies. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And the doubting system, the more you, or the, my experience is the more you read about it, the more you understand it. I mean, I haven't even gone into the use of intelligence and such like, yeah. and the, the nitty gritty of it. It's an incredible tool that's come up, that's been prepared. And if I had to put one factor on why the Battle of Britain was a success, it was that it was the doubting system and, and Britain was ready for it. It was the, it was the battle it was going to, to fight. Um, and, and as I say, as soon as they go on to the offensive, these fighters in 1941, they're having to start from scratch and having yeah. terrible losses. So, yeah, that, that says a lot. It says more about the system than it does about the individual fighters in that respect, I, I, I think, anyway. No, absolutely. I mean, but as we said, you know, our, our heads will understand it's the Dowdy mm -hmm. system. Our hearts will always some way have some kind of yeah. lo loyalty to Spitfire because it's yeah. the Spitfire. Yeah. Um, and that's where I we are with this. Yeah, so James, we will, we will call it there. And folks, it's been a whirlwind, right? These three shows. There's more, three more coming your way tomorrow. We talk about the Dirty Dozen, amongst other things. There were another three guests. Um, I've been thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it's lots of questions coming in, but the format I think is working. And James will come back and have you on at some point to do a longer format show. We talked about something. I forget what we thought about, but we can do that at some point. And I hope I'll have a beer with you in January when I'm over in England. But right now, folks, I will say good night or good afternoon, depending on where you are. And we'll be back again for some more tomorrow. So thanks, everybody, for your views. And don't forget, if you're new to the channel, click subscribe, like, share, do all the usuals. Thanks, everybody. Bye.